Okay, so this is topic six of information system security and privacy overview. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about here is provide a basic understanding of ISS or information system security uh, topic areas, identify the purpose of what we call the CIA or information security triad, identify and understand purpose of information security tools, and some guidelines and some ideas around how you can use security to protect yourself. So, um, let's start off, there's a couple of videos that are out there on YouTube that uh, would be of, might be of interest, uh, you know, with regard to security. So there's one out here, that, this first one, 25 biggest cyber attacks in history, a couple years old, uh, probably a little bit dated, I think there actually might have been some larger ones, but it was actually some, uh, it's interesting to watch because it really does give a... Uh, Kind of, an, you see, kind of different examples and different patterns that have, that are uh, that are shown up in terms of security. There's a, a number Nova, which is the PBS Science series, has done a number of different um, shows talking about cybersecurity. So you know, an overview of you know, cybersecurity 101, um, codes and privacy parable. Pretty good. Pretty interesting uh, descriptions around the applications and some real-life examples of cybersecurity. And then uh, OnGuardOnline.gov also provides some guidelines around computer security as well. A couple of things uh, that might be of interest in particular around this idea of not just security, cybersecurity, but also cyber war fighting. So there's two articles or two videos. One is actually generated by the Army, Army, Army Cyber Warfighting, and then also a, um, an overview of a cyber defense competition that was established, kind of describing um, some approaches around, you know, kind of the idea of leveraging um, cyber attack techniques. So some basics, when we talk about information system security, um, at the basic part is it's all about risk management. So risk management is the heart of information security. Uh, a couple, you know, and this takes on a whole bunch of different dimensions. So you know, when you look at security, security is a very broad um, topic area which ranges across the whole breadth and depth of information. So a couple of things that you you know, a couple of things to maybe think about or some things that you you know in looking at. You know, the question would be, you know, a if a, like for example, Apple um, has a, uh, will automatically download or attempt to update software in your machine. The question is, you know, do you trust that software provider? Well, how do you know that what is being installed in your machine is actually secure? Um, you know, a, if an attacker would somehow be able to find a way to, pretend that it was a, a, a legitimate provider, basically you could gain full control of your machine. So um, one question, you know, another thing, another area, topic area, around personal information, you know, question of you know, treating personal information like cash, because quite frankly, it, it can be used as cash, basically, you know, if you, if you gain um, key information around a, an individual, both their something along the lines of their social security number or bank information, you know, basically you can access their, their assets and then pretend that they are you. Um, that's a, that's a large area. The identities of individuals, you know, confer confirmation of that companies and people are who they think they are. You know, the internet is, was never designed to have implicit, uh, tracking was designed for connectivity. It was not designed necessarily with any forms of built-in security. So that's something, you know, an ongoing issue has been within um, information security is how do you prove that somebody is who they say they are? Um, this idea of accessing information over encrypted websites. And 
early implementations of the internet, you know, kind of, you know, the first generation of internet information security basically was, was all open text traffic just flowing over. It could be intercepted and accessed. A lot of information was out there. So you, we've seen this move towards what we call HTTPS, uh, which is an encrypted, uh, basically using an encrypted uh, communication between the browser and the uh web server um, so the idea is that what you would do is you you establish a you establish an encrypted connection and then uh, every all the information any information that flows back and forth cannot be accessed um, so the idea of personal information you know protecting personal information so you know there's some is actually an, if you think about it it's an extension of uh, you know what you, we've always has done with paper. So the idea of you know locking file cabinets and you know putting it you know key information in, in areas uh, has always in secured areas has always been an issue. Uh, in digital in the digital world, you know we have kind of the same the same issues. But the idea of being able to use uh, protecting that information using digital techniques, which is you know use of passwords or encryptions and a number of different approaches to be able to deal with uh, the protection of this personal information. And finally, backups. So backup is, a, you know, the ability to, or the, the, the process by which you transfer information from one uh, form of data storage to another. So in case if the first one was damaged or uh, destroyed, you could bring, you could bring it back. For example, I actually on my machine, my machine here, I actually have two disk drives of the same size when I just simply will back up things, I will back up data from one system to the other on an ongoing basis. And it has, I can, I can attest to the fact that it has saved me on a number of, on a number of times and uh, with storing stuff. But, you know, this is, you know, it can be done on the personal level and is also done on the large scale enterprise level. One question around information system security is really the the cost associated with it. I mean, it's a you know you don't get it for free, and and quite I'm actually much more so than getting it for free. It's actually a fair amount of work and energy and the resources have to be applied. So securing information systems, you have to understand both the uh, vulnerabilities and you know what are the matching tools, you know, so strategies controls and tools to be able to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Uh, things that have to be weighed or should be weighed from an organizational perspective is, you know, what are the organizational losses? So, you know, obviously uh, protected information, proprietary information being being taken from the organization by competitors or um, foreign countries or, or you know, in situations of commercial, you know, idea of lawsuits from from either consumers or from stockholders for, you know, unauthorized disclosure of information. So, you know, we're, we're seeing more in the news, we're seeing more and more stories about, you know, organizations that did not have really any good security uh, protocols, procedures in place, and they're now paying the price with, you know, lawsuits and government actions against them. One challenge around that, and I guess kind of it also ties into the overhead, you know, over and above the cost overhead, there's a trade-off for what we call user experience. If, you know, if it is possible to provide security, you know, high levels of security in a system, but at the cost of making it difficult for a user to be able to access the data. Um, example, if you had to enter a password every time you needed to, um, get to something, you know, it would get after a while, it would, it would get um, tiresome. So the, you know, one of the challenges, especially in security design, is being able to balance off, um, you know, user experience versus security. You know, you really don't, you know, we, a lot of times what's happened is, is that security is actually uh, sacrificed in order to achieve, you know, a, a desired level of of uh, user experience, however, you know, you're leaving the door open for um, security breaches and attacks. 
So there's something we call the CIA triad. So, you know, we talk around risk management. So there's two pieces I would I always, I always think of when we talk about security. One is the idea of risk management. The other is this idea of the CIA triad. So there's really three components you always want to keep in mind when we talk about security. And, you know, it, it's referred to as the CIA triad. You know, they, the CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. All right. Definition of confidentiality, you know, restrict access on authorized entities and preserving authorized restrictions on access and disclosed means by which personal information and proprietary information can be protected. All right, so basically you want to make sure the data is of uh, the people who access data are the people who have permissions to access data. If you don't have permission to access data, you don't access it. Um, Integrity is really guaranteeing that the data has not been, you know, when you receive data, if you if you uh, access something, that it is correct, that it has not been altered, you know, improper information modification, something has been changed, the numbers are what they should be. So, you know, the key words when we think about uh, authorization is non-repudiation and authenticity. And third, availability. So availability is, you know, information services can be accessed when needed. Um, you know, you want to have timely, reliable access and use of information. You know, one of the well-known attacks that are, uh, are used in uh, by hackers is what they call denial of service attack, distributed denial of service attack, where basically you uh, disrupt the communication to a website so you can't get access to it. So that's what kind of falls into to the area of availability of the CIA trade. But this, these three components are the, you know, make up of the, is a foundational piece of what we think of as security. Beyond the, the CIA triad, there's actually particular focus areas within, you know, kind of within that. So this kind of gives us a list of the, the major pieces. All right. So you've got um, the area, you know, identification, authorization, identity, and access management, basically being able to uh, manage credentials, um, president, the presentation, and then um, access the systems using those credentials. So that's kind of a foundational piece. Basic cryptography, which is really focused on confidentiality, basically being able to uh, take data convert it into a non a non readable format and then being able to reverse that telecommunications and network security is a, you know as we think about now you know the idea of the internet the dominance of the internet in in, in computing these days um, telecommunications network security is a, is, a, is a primary component of that there's other things though like software development and security architecture and design, which are related to uh, kind of your development and and structuring of how you do security, how you know how you how you make sure that the software that is developed is developed securely and does not have any vulnerabilities in it. Security architecture and design is kind of from the broader perspective of you know what is in place and how how do things run. This is continuity disaster recovery planning, you know, tied to availability, making sure that if you lose data, and it's kind of related back to when we talked about backups, if you lose data or if you lost access to a data center, data center was destroyed, or, you know, if you lost power for extended periods of time, take the example like Puerto Rico, uh, that you would have the ability to resume operations and resume access to the computer system. So this is really, you know, some of this is technical, some of this is process, some of this is business. So it's kind of a broad, but it's a broad area, actually a big area in its own right. Uh, physical security, you know, which is actually the, um, takes many forms, especially, you know, it gets very interesting, especially as we get into things like mobility. If it used to be, you know, physical security related to just a data center, now you've got Physical security you know, relates to mobile devices and laptops to, you know, being able to have things like uh, protecting the device, being able to get access to the device, be able to erase data on the device when it is physically stolen. 
Um, and the last two, uh, governance, risk management, security policies, you know, basically part of the overall, how do you run your security? How do you, you know, establish structures and controls uh, and implement them within an organization? So these last two are really organizational kinds of things, not really technical per se, but they are, you know, extraordinarily important for, you know, effectively implementing it. There's nothing about security that you know, just just happens. It has to be implemented. It has to be planned. It has to be executed. And it has to be done on an ongoing basis. So a little more details around uh, some of these things. Authentication, you know, being able to, you know, um, identify the identity of something through... A, we call different factors. So the, there's three factors, and usually what a best practice is to at least have two of these three factors in place. So the first factor would be something you would know. Example of that would be a username and password. You know, something you would have would be something like a physical key or a card token, or something like, for example, you would plug into your PC that would you know that you would have with your person. All right. What you see a lot of times now, what will happen is applications will use your phone number and send you a text message um, as a means of, of uh, you know, it, for to meet this requirement here. So what will happen is you put your phone number in, and then what it will do is it will send you a text, and you enter the key, the key that it sends you as the entry into the, uh, as the entry in to gain access. And the third part is something you are, so called biometrics. So it could be fingerprints, it could be DNA, it could be um, iris scans, it could be any number of different, you know, biological entities. What you're seeing now is, you know, the best practice is two of the three. You're seeing more, you know, you're seeing much more of one and two. Some degree of three, you know, if you look like the new iPhone, do facial scans, um, you know, and I think they've they've actually have had fingerprints around. You know, using fingerprints as a as a as a mechanism on iPhones for a bit of time. So there's you know a couple different you know all three of these come in play. The ones that are most common though is usually going to be username, password, and combined with a um, key or card token. As you say, multi-factor combines two or more factors. And the idea is a mutual. You, you end up having a combination of a combination of two. Um, so it's not a one-way authentication. So password attack. So, you know, how do you attack a password? And there's a couple different ways to do it. I mean, one approach would be brute force attacks. Basically, you use, you know, trial or, or you know, basically trying every combination of, of, of letters to, um, to guess a password. Um, some interesting variants of this. Um, there was one we would call a dictionary attack. Dictionary attack is you take every word in the dictionary and um, apply those, you know, every word in the dictionary to the, uh, as, as a potential password. Um, the issue you run into a lot of times with brute force attacks is that the, you know, there's a lot of combinations of, of letters and, you know, that can be going to a password. However, computers are actually have gotten, you know, the ability to generate this stuff and do this stuff programmatically is, is, has actually increased as well. So, for example, uh, thinking to the effect of you can enter, um, a computer can do like something to the effect of 8, 000, 8 million guesses per second. So you think about the, you know, it's obviously the, the uh, you know, in a brute force attack, with enough compute power, you can, you know, with enough compute power and a simple enough password, you can guess that, all right? So this actually, you know, so you've seen some of this, but actually the more common way of doing it is actually through social engineering. You know, the way you get a password from someone is you trick them into giving it to you or, uh, you know, by either pretexting or phishing, you know, basically, um, you know, sending an email or, you know, you call a help desk and say, hey, can you, you know, can you unlock my, my system, change my password for me? Um, or phishing, where you get an email that looks legitimate, but the reality is what it will do is has the objective of getting you to enter key, you know, critical information and then kind of 
you know, extracting it off. Um, spear fishing is actually a very specific, you know, it's fishing, but it's also a very specific, uh, fishing going against a very specific target. So they, you identify who the individual you want to go to and you actually make it looks like it's something from somebody, a person, a person they would know, you know. And then whaling, which is the ability to get uh, you know, kind of kind of working up, you know, a chain where you get a big fish through smaller fish. All right. But all of these are, you know, all legitimate, especially one of the reasons you need you, you know, your best practice is to have more than one factor is, you, you know, passwords can be uh, subverted and, and, and uh, there's different t techniques that have been proven to work to make these things, you know, passwords not a foolproof means of providing protection. Access control, um, basically the uh, provides protection once you get authorization to get onto, uh, authentication to get onto a system, authorization will let you um, s establishes what you can get at while you're on the system. So the idea of MOVA, when you think about a computer system, you know, you use, you, you authenticate to get in, and if somebody was able to guess the password, you know, you, you establish a limit of what they can get at. So it's, you know, obviously the, the big thing you'd always want to get would be something to the effect of a, you know, what they call like a system password or something administrator control, which basically kind of overrides or, you know, the ability to access everything. Um, so the idea is that what you do is by putting uh, access control, you limit, you can limit uh, what, you know, what you would have access to. So a couple different ways this gets implemented, ACL, access control list, basically, uh, you know, you, you apply individual based, uh, you know, what you can get files and stuff. ACLs by themselves actually can get pretty complicated because you have a lot of different thing, resources and a lot of different things you're going to be going after. So it's a, you know, a large system, you know, thousands of users, this becomes very complicated and awkward. Um, a couple of approaches they've taken to, to uh, improve that, what we call role-based access control, RBAC. Basically, what you you do is a you establish what a a particular job uh, should have access to. You create what they call a role, and then the users are assigned all of those for that role. So, if you're a uh, a payroll clerk, you know you have access to everything you need to get to in the system that is associated with payroll. An attribute is kind of a variant of that where, you know, you're establishing various, uh, you assign um, ACLs based upon a particular attribute, you know, not necessarily a role. Role is one type, but there are other attributes you can use as well. So identification administration, IDAM, you know, um, this is actually a, a definition or a, a model that has been developed by uh, a best practice, which has been defined by by NIST around you know things you'd want to have in a an ideal system. So the you know, architecture of a system, um, you know, the objective of restrict access to authorized users, while ensuring confidentiality, integrity, availability of resources and information. So this kind of describes a you know a service where you would establish a you know, identity service, some type of, you know, attribute-based control system with policies and audits. So single sign-on is an interesting, is an interesting um, topic. So the idea is that, we, you know, without single sign-on, especially we have applications, a lot of different applications, and with each one with its own password, you have lots and lots and lots of passwords. And what happens is that that actually generates all sorts of bad habits of people. Like, for example, if you have five passwords, people will write five pass, you know, write them down on, you know, a, a post-it note and put it on their computer. Uh, so, you know, you, so the idea, if you can get to a single password, that becomes an easier, uh, from a management perspective, uh, a better, a better approach. Problem is, it's actually kind of hard to do. Because obviously, you know, trying to coordinate multiple activities, you know, multiple, um, you know, 
gain commonality across multiple applications, you know, for a single idea is actually, you know, kind of gets, can get really complicated, especially as you get more and more. So you've got you know, a number of different approaches I've taken around using like what we call a X509, which is a, you know, identity certificates. Uh, also being able to use something like an L, a common LDAP. So the, the big one everybody kind of know, knows about is um, Active Directory, Microsoft's Active Directory, which is an implementation of that. Everybody uses, um, everybody will use that. Uh, another thing we've seen, uh, if you look at things like Facebook, you know, or Twitter, basically is using social media uh, identity as kind of a means of, as a common identity that can be used to gain access to systems. Um, so there's a number of ways to do it. There's no one way of doing it, and it's, you know, it can actually get pretty challenging as you as you kind of move into this stuff. So a couple of things to look at here. You can take a look at these two. You know, there's two movies here. There's one around kind of a, kind of gives you the model of, of encryption, you know, and then also kind of the difference between a symmetric and public key cryptography. Cryptography is basically the, you know the process of encoding data. Um, so to provide to basically to obscure its uh, the, its contents in such a fashion so that you can. Um, it can be transmitted without, you know, without risk of being intercepted, and then restored back to its original, um, to its original form, you know, using with, by an individual who would have a key. So the whole idea of a, you know, the idea of a key, the key terms get used on this is plain text, which is your original data, uh, which is then converted using the key and a encryption algorithm to what we call cybertext. Um, and then that is reversed using the, you know, basically a reversal of the process. So there's two steps. One is the encryption of the data followed by the decryption of the data. Um, what you'll have is this is a kind of a, this is an example of a, you know, kind of the public, a public-private key uh, methodology in where basically encryption can, will be established using a a public key. You encrypt with a public key, and then you decrypt with a private key. So it's a, it's actually the other approach you would have is you if you have a single key, you can encrypt using a single key, passing that key across to uh, the other party. And then it can use that key to um, to decrypt the message. Uh, the challenge with a lot of this stuff is the key management, making sure you you know you, that you have the correct key. Keys are uh, maintained and protected uh, through the whole process. So this right here, this this NIST uh, article here, um, really gives a whole um, series of guidelines around you know recommendations around what we we do about keys and. You know how you generate keys, generate and manage keys. This is just an example of a simple, um, you know, substitution cipher, which has actually been around a long time. So the idea is, your key would be wherever you would start. So say, for example, you align the inner, the inner key with the outer, key, or the inner with the outer um, wheels. And then what will happen is whatever, you know, however these things line up. So a U, you know, if your key is U, you line U with A. And then you kind of work your way around. So, for example, a, you know, a, a U is an A, a V is a B, a W is a C, and so on and so forth as you go around. So it's an interactive substitution cipher. And it's actually been around. And actually, it, it is, you know, it's not, you know, it's... Not the most effective, but it, you know, it, in, in past it has been used, and actually, you know, I think it goes back to the, t the to the days of Caesar. I think Caesar, I think there's reports or uh, historical records of this being done. Uh, Caesar in the Roman army was using a substitution cipher for uh, uh, passing communications. So network security, you know, the big issue with network security is the ability to make sure 
that information as it passes from you know one system to the other, um, it cannot be intercepted or modified in 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 flight. So there's a thing called uh, you know within TCP/IP, which we talked about with the networking, there is what we call SSL secure socket layer TLS, which is actually a newer implementation of SSL. Um, it helps ensure the uh, confidential integrity of information as it moves. So the idea is the tunnel, this communication, you know, between one side to the other, by default with an IP can be intercepted. So you can actually have somebody in the middle. We, this type of attack is called, we call a man in the middle attack. So basically what will happen is the, the sending party, you will intercept the information to the sending party, and then it will be sent back to the, you know, before it along, and then capturing the information. As you, as you go with the man in the middle of the day. So the idea of encryption is that before any data is, tra is traffic is passed across the link, there is a negotiation between the browser and the server, and then a, a secured connection is established, and then data is passed back and forth over the secured connection. And this is just an example of the steps. So there's a whole series of, there's a setup, um, you know, kind of a request response back and forth between um, the client and the server as they're going through the key exchange, cipher negotiations, the get requests. And then, you know, once that's established and uh, communication can be passed securely from one side to the other. Firewalls, really, or it, it's a tool. Uh, protect organizational compute assets for really at the what we call the packet level. All right. So the idea is that um, a packet a firewall will sit between a local network and the internet and will monitor the traffic. Actually, look at the packets data as packets as as it's coming through and make decisions around whether or not packets could or could be passed or uh, stopped. So a hardware firewall, you know, is basically in a hardware implementation or design of a device that does this. Software firewall actually runs on the computer, can runs part of the operating system, runs as, as, as something on the computer and intercepts data as it comes through. Um, the idea of a firewall is, you know, you know, the, it stops at what most of modern security designs usually will have layers of firewalls. So it's not a single firewall. Usually you will see, you know, multiple layers um, of, you know, of things. so you're monitoring traffic as things pass through multiple levels. So, you know, the term that gets used around this from a security perspective, we call it defense in depth. Uh, and there's another probably well-known concept in security, computer security, where what they'll do is they'll use two firewalls to create kind of a space in between, well, like an inner firewall, outer firewall, and then the space in between is what they call a DMZ, which will hold, basically you can put computers in there that can uh, could be accessed from the internet. Um, so, you know, to streamline that, that traffic flow, but not permitting, not necessarily permitting access to uh, the further, you know, the further layer on back. Uh, VPN basically is a, uh, a technique. Actually, it's a combination of, of software, can be hardware as well, um, but establishes a tunnel through the firewall. So, you know, it's sort of as we talked about with, you know, as we talked about the secured socket layer, this is really kind of a... Uh, a secure socket layer that actually lets you go through the firewall, passes through the firewall, uh, and establishes a tunnel through the firewall. Uh, so the idea is if somebody's on the internet, so if you're in the internet in Australia um, and you have a computer system or a firewall, a computer network that's located in, in Philadelphia, you can use the internet, you know, basically flow across the internet to the um, you know through the firewall and access systems inside of it. This is used very extensively in companies and actually been you know a very well established technology. IDS is basically something that would sit on the uh, a tool 
that wouldn't be installed on the firewall. So the idea is it, it watches for behavior. So what it'll do is it'll watch for, you know, as traffic, as, as packets and traffic, you know, comes and goes, it will watch for certain types of behaviors and then set alerts out. So the idea is that, um, for example, if there's a behavior um, in which a computer is sending information to some sort of unknown domain, uh, it can set an alert out and you can log different types of information. So there's a whole, you know, um, area of um, research around this being able to, you know, basically want two parts. Number one is actually gathering and monitoring the information. And then also the analysis of the information once you get it. Because what a lot of times what we're seeing now is attacks are using what we call advanced persistent threats. So what happens is it, a machine, you know, um, malware will, will go onto a machine, it will lay low, and then only occasionally, um, you know, probe and kind of look. So the idea is what an intrusion detection system would do would be monitoring the network, kind of looking for activities. Like if you see a particular machine that wakes up and does a scan of the network and does it once every half hour, then that's a potentially a malware work doing and doing a network scan, doing a reconnaissance of the of the uh, of a network. All right. And then, but also this gener you know, you think about the number of devices and the number of stuff that's out there. This can can be you know these log files can be very large. So the ability to kind of analyze this stuff, you know, one first part is capturing it. The other part is actually analyzing it and looking for patterns of behavior. So and both those make up what we call IDS. IDS a lot of, we're seeing a lot of times now is IDS is actually a lot of times IDS systems are baked into the firewall itself. So it's actually part and parcel of the firewall. Security development security. Software, software development, security, and privacy. You know, uh, the information that um, well, the term gets used is um, data in transit and then data at rest. So the idea is like with SSL, you're protecting data as it's in transit, as it moves from one side to the other. But then once it's in a system, once it's in a database, making sure that the data is protected and then from a you know software development perspective that the applications are you know are verified and tested and scanned on an ongoing basis and there's protection around um, provided around um, software so if, say for example if an attacker can somehow contaminate an application the source code of an application um, and then that that was to be sent out basically you would have an entry way you know you, an entryway of vulnerability across you know, any number, millions of devices. All right, so it's a big, so it's a big uh, piece. And if we look down here, uh, NIST uh, special publication 800-122 uh, provides a whole guidelines around uh, the confidential, protecting the confidentiality of, of what we call PII, personally identifiable information. Malware. You know, it can be any number of things. So, you know, it's, you know, we've, we always think of viruses and spyware and things like that. Terminology gets used now is, is malware. So basically, it's a whole, they comes in all sorts of forms um, and can do all sorts of things. So some things will, you know, try to attack machines, will, cap, you know, will, you know, uh, destroy data. Other things will look to capture information. Other things will try to you know, basically navigate a network and collect information off of, uh, off of uh, keyboards, you know, basically you know, monitoring keyboard traffic and kind of gathering information, um, any number of things, all right? So, you know, what we see now is, you know, the modern, one of the big modern um, attacks are that you, people will be creating what we call a, using botnets. So the idea is you have a, you put a deploy malware on millions of machines and then from a centralized location basically send commands out for them to do things so you'll see things like spam you know the technical you know you can you know deploy malware to a million machines and they basically use those machine million machines to send spam or to attack basically to a denial of service against a particular uh, system 
So the, as I said, this is, you know, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff around viruses, a lot of stuff around, uh, you know, being able to scan things. But, you know, a lot of stuff now, it's actually more behavior based. So actually looking at what uh, activities are going on either on the systems or on the network and then trying to pin that back to, you know, what might be the work of malware. This is a very complicated chart here. So, but this is really kind of a guideline of NIST. When we talk about cloud computing, this is what, you know, NIST's definition of what cloud computing. And you might see, you know, some of our familiar terms here, you know, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. So this is a, a kind of a conceptual model of what um, a cloud should have in terms of security. This is a model, not necessarily an implementation. So, you know, what you would see if you, if you look at AWS or, you know, or Azure, you'll see probably something that might resemble this, probably with different names or kind of different functions and whatnot. But, you know, these are all basically this would be a best practice, a definition of a best practice model for uh, a secure cloud. Backup recovery, you know, all information needs to be backed up. The, the expectation is that, you know, if you have digital information, that, then you, you possibly always exist that it can be damaged or stolen or lost. So the idea is that you need to back up things on an ongoing basis. The frequency of backups uh, really depends on the type of data. You know, where is it stored? How is it stored? The value of the data. Uh, for example, um, like one of the issue, one of the issues we're you know we've had discussions with Campbell's, Campbell's about is they'll have like a 20, 30 terabyte database which runs their business. If you know if the system goes down for even a minute, it could be all sorts of you know all sorts of problems in terms of running their business operations. And what happens though if uh, they're backing it up, you know, nightly? But the problem is it would probably take you know a couple of days to restore it. So, you know, the question of whether or not you, you would create a, uh, you know, a different approach to backing things up is something, is, is a question. But every organization has the same thing. So, so what will happen is a lot of times with backups, you take the backup and you store, it gets stored in a site other than where the computers are at. So the idea is if something was to happen to the building or the facility, computers at, you always have something stored off-site. Business continuity, I mean, as we had talked about this, this is a, you know, NIST has a whole, a specific diagram, 834, dealing with um, disaster recovery and planning. Uh, so this, you know, this is a, a, a really a process. This is actually a business plan. It's a combination of business plan plus architecture design and uh you know, kind of combined together of how you, you know, what you have and what you can restore and how quickly you can restore. Physical security is the protection of hardware and software components. You know, obviously the, the more valuable, uh, the more valuable components would be, should put in more secured locations. Um, you know, data centers historically have been treated as high security um, areas Really, if you can get into a computer room and get access to the console, you can do a lot of stuff on a computer. So, you know, the idea of restricting access. This has become much more challenging in particular as, uh, you know, as we said around with kind of have things have changed in terms of the idea of the types of data that can be stored on mobile devices. So physical security for a device that's being transported in someone's pocket is a um, is pretty challenging it's a pretty challenging uh, problem to try to, to deal with this on an ongoing basis. You see a lot of, you know, the ability to put software where they can manage and track where things are at is, is an approach they take with mobility. But So governance and risk management. So this is a kind of a high level. You probably want to take a look at this. This is a high level model from NIST around how um, kind of a, a life cycle of, you know, the of how you should apply risk management. So, you know, inventory of, of systems, selecting controls, implementation of controls, assessment, authorization, monitoring. So this becomes, this is, the idea is this is really kind of a, a cycle in which you kind of start off with this categorization of your information systems. And then 
we're kind of walking around and kind of methodically working through this stuff. The whole the 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 focus area with this idea of risk management and the governance of stuff is thoroughness, you know, repeatability, iterations, doing it again and again. So the idea is you go through it, you evaluate, you implement something, you evaluate, you measure it, you evaluate the results, and then you adjust as you go. So the, spe so the idea of security is not a one-time thing. Security is an ongoing continuous process but it actually takes a fair amount of effort and commitment of an organization so and policy so security policy is really basically defining you know basically defining things around uh, security confidence really how you your organizational will deal with CIA so the guiding principles of confidential confidentiality integrity and availability it covers both technical administrative you know, it includes guidelines for, you know, what is the use of information, you know, of use of, of information assets. So say, for example, if um, someone was to, uh, you know, using a company or an organizational uh, computer to run their own offshore casino, that should be called out in terms of, some, except, you know, that should fall under what we, we would call an acceptable use policy. Yeah, and, you know, this idea of, you know, the security policies, it's really the starting point. So every organization, you should be able to go to any organization and request a list of what their security policies are. Personal information security. So this is kind of a guideline for what, you know, is what you should be thinking about in your with your own computers and, you know, basically what, you know, keep yourself protected. Um, you know, for step one would be making sure you apply the latest updates Updates, you know, a lot of what goes in updates these days now are security, security patches, security fixes. So keeping, you know, go, going to the most, you know, trying to get to the stay to the most up-to-date version is very important. Um, also, antivirus software implementation, particularly on PCs. Now, Macintoshes and Linux, historically not so much, though I think as time has been going on, I think, the, you know, I think this... The school of thought is that you know all devices should have some type of antivirus protection, even though you know it's Windows machines are the most notorious. But I thought other ones all have everything's got its same has to deal with that. Uh, being aware of you know removable uh, media data like USB drives or network connections. You know USB drives are a well-known attack vector. You know the idea is what you do. If you wanted to get into a, a, a organization or get into their systems, you just scatter around a couple, of, you know, USB drives in the lobby of a of a company. Somebody would pick it up and hopefully plug it into their um, company PC and potentially affect the machine. Backing up of data, you know, basically a fundamental. You know, if you lose your hard drive, if you lose the data, you know, if you don't have it backed up, it it can be can be gone. Um, the idea of using two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is becoming more and more common. So passwords, you know, effective long passwords, you know, but is, you know, is, is something that should be done, but where you can use two-factor would probably be a better, is a better approach. Um, passwords, long, strong, and unique. So the longer you make a password, the more difficult it is to um, to guess it. All right. So you know, obviously, the more letters you add to the end of your, you know, more letters you put into your password. I think the number now that you know you see a lot of times you want to have at least, you know, password designs. A lot of sites become uh, at least eight characters long, no repeating characters. You know, X number of uppercase versus lowercase and combinations of special characters. Yeah, and then you know a best practice would be you use different passwords to different accounts. So one password does not encrypt, or excuse me, one password compromise does not provide access to all the other accounts. Easier said than done. And obviously, if you implement so if you implement a single sign-on configuration, one password will give you could potentially give you access to multiple accounts. So it's a you know the idea is that you don't necessarily want to be totally dependent on just using a password. You know, if you have a um, 
a two-factor approach, then just simply having a password, losing a password, or having a password compromise will not necessarily grant full access to your uh, resources. And then also with phishing, finally, you know, strange links and attachments, messages from people, you know, sources you don't know of. You know, a lot of stuff now, you know, most, most systems, will, most mail systems will, will filter a lot of stuff out. But, um, you know, it's based on patterns and stuff. You, know, you always have to kind of keep a watch and you know, have a good understanding, especially if anything is in your junk, goes into your junk mail folder and, you know, you, you look at the messages, you know, you really don't want to click anything. Because what will happen is if you click it, it, you know, it basically, it can download actually very you know doesn't take much to download you know malware because what will happen is that the initial attack is usually a very small piece of code that is specifically designed to go back out later on and, and bring in more stuff all right so so be, always be suspicious of uh, strange links and attachments and emails or uh, on websites mobile security just kind of wrap some stuff up here the idea of you know, mobility puts a whole new world into security. You know, so all of the stuff that you could get with, you know, computers, basically data centers, are now in everyone's pocket. All right, so the idea of, um, you know, the information of data that's being stored on the PC, plus also the use of a, of a, you know, of a smartphone for all sorts of, you know, the amount of information or types of information um, for data theft. Um, Actually, one of the big things over the years this has come up is the idea of the ability of a smartphone as a recording device. Basically, it is a built-in video camera slash uh, audio recorder. So the idea is, you know, every person, and plus it also has the ability to be tracked and traced. Um, so the idea is that, you know, as a potential, I mean, from a, as an attack vector from all sorts of fashions, um, you're seeing more and more, like, especially in confidential areas of, you know, basically isolation of, of devices, isolation of basically no access of uh, those devices into, you know, secured, you know, basically weight room types of environments. And then, you know, some of the policies associated with that. Once again, here's another guidelines from um, from NIST around some managers. But these are some of the things you'd want to see include in, in these policies. Use of the camera, use of voice, applications that run on it, uh, encryption of data on it, uh, VPN settings, Bluetooth use, or excuse me, Bluetooth settings, VPN use, um, loss and stolen information, and then also device backup. So just a quick summary here, you know, uh, you know, as computing resources have become more integral, you know, the activity, the ability to use criminals to do this has also increased. So the idea of this, you know, overview, you know, is really as a means of protection against, you know, compromise and, and you know, protection against you know, Ill, illegal or uh, criminal activity. You know, the, you know, there's different terms that get used around white hat hackers versus black hat hackers versus gray hat hackers. You know, so the so the idea is that both all hackers are kind of using the same approach, the same technique, same technology. The difference between a ISS professional from a hacker is really that you know their approach, their focus, and their values. All right. So this is a set of the study questions for uh, section six, and then the um, the reflection question associated with this, and that is it.